and it was hard for the father to have any rights to have visitation rights and stuff like that it was a different time back then and my mom did not make it easy on him at all she's an interesting person so i had to learn to be i i would say learn to be spiritual but i would say i had to remember spirituality at a young age because i don't think that we really learn anything in this incarnation i think that we just at best we have a chance to remember our true nature hi everyone welcome to sunday communion podcast where we have free flow conversations with friends about their lives their past present and what's in store for our future we discuss overcoming obstacles spiritual experiences next chapters life's profound moments in a warm communion with a friend together we dive deep into the journey of personal growth and collective healing by healing ourselves and sharing those journeys i'm your host lee papa join us in today's episode we will be exploring with musician yogi sage and author ricky Rohr. Ricky, a Kansas City native, spent 30 years as a professional singer in Las Vegas before finding peace through yoga. In his book, Didn't Believe It, Do Now, From the Head to the Heart, his writing is vulnerable and straightforward, sharing his journey from addiction and time in an atheistic cult to the clarity he found in his spiritual practice. Now a full-time yoga teacher, Ricky's life experiences offer insight for those disillusioned by organized religion or seeking a deeper connection to their higher self. A lifelong student of philosophy and religion, Ricky continues to grow and share his wisdom with the world. Please help us welcome Ricky Rohr to the podcast by giving him a shout out in the comment section, sending some love for his authenticity and for sharing his extraordinary journey with us. Welcome, Ricky. Thanks. Good to see you. So I'm super excited about diving in here. Everyone has a backstory. And your book beautifully details your journey and references three different lives or parts. So let's start there. What were the three distinct parts of your play, if you will? My answer now, compared to when the book was finished uh, six years ago, probably a little bit different. It would be pre-Dark Night of the Soul, Dark Night of the Soul, and post. Okay. And, And who knows, maybe there would be another Dark Night of the Soul. I don't know. But... That's the way I would summarize that. It was, uh, it was almost 30 years there. Well, excuse me, almost 23 years where I didn't really believe in a soul. I did when I was younger. I didn't for over 20 years. And then I herself got a hold of me and pulled me by the ear and said, come on, we're going back. And um, and that's where I am now. Yes. Does that answer your question? Sure. I'd like to do a kind of a deeper dive into the beginning portion of your book right so you have you have your book broken out into these three sections so if you would go into early years a little bit and did you have there's my dog going out the the uh the curtains there did you have a spiritual basis when you were growing up i did i adored philosophy and uh, i felt like uh, even then an old soul and i would have um like a lot, several people that I know, I was the one for the neighborhood. All the all the people would come to me, asking me, you know, how do you have, how how are you happy, even though you have this situation in your life, you know, divorced parents and this and that, and a stepfather who was not very kind, etc. Like, I knew at an early age it was really really important to forgive people because I didn't like hanging on to that energy. But it so all through my um my 20s, I was always that person that people would come to, even people who were 15, 20 years older than me. I just had kind of a, I was comfortable in philosophy and and uh, not being too caught up in feeling the victim. I was really good at not playing the victim. At what age, you would say, in your 20s? I figured the, the victim thing out when I was eight. Um, eight? Yeah. Um, because my mom and stepdad, uh, it wasn't a really great environment. Then I was with my dad on the, on the weekends. Uh, so I had a really, a, a lot of contrast. My dad, who was extremely loving. Um, and, uh, then my mom and stepdad who were in, not so much, but they did the best they could. And I knew that they, I knew they were doing the best they could. You uh, did it eight? Yes. 
Yeah, and that frustrated my dad to no end. I, he's like, how can you forgive them so easily for what they're doing? And I was like, I don't know, I just do. Yeah, because being empathic and suppose I was holding on to that, it, yeah, so I figured out if I hold on to that and not forgive what's going on, then I'm just walking around with it. It's not affecting them. I could tell that it wasn't bothering them. I just knew that it was affecting me, and I didn't want to carry that weight around. That's incredible that that was an awareness for you at such a young age. And do, do you do you agree that that's pretty pretty incredible at such a young age? I, I do now. I mean, I didn't know any different when I was eight. I thought that everybody figured it out at eight. Gotcha. You know, like these people who see angels and see spirits in the room, stuff like that, they think everybody can do that, you know? I don't see them so much, but that's the path that I had, or that my soul wanted to, to guide me through. I love the relationship between you and your dad in the book. I feel like I know him, so I, I don't want to give any of that away because it's really a yummy part of your book, the relationship aspect of that. And so what would you say was the youngest age you were before, when you had like your first spiritual experience, did, were you raised in religion? No, my dad, as I mentioned, uh, my parents were divorced when I was four. And he was a single father in the 60s. And it was hard for the father to have any rights, to have visitation rights and stuff like that. It was a different time back then. And my mom did not make it easy on him at all. She's an interesting person. So... I had to learn to be, I, I would say learn to be spiritual, but I would say I had to remember spirituality at a young age because I don't think that we really learn anything in this incarnation. I think that we just, at best, we have a chance to remember our true nature and to remember um, who we really are. Even though I departed from that whole thing for over 23 years, at that point in my life, to answer your question, that's that's who and where I was. So you were a pretty connected kid. And then walk us through how that transitioned into being a musician and that whole chapter. Well, as a kid, I was really sensitive and uh, rather codependent. Now I understand at this point in my life that this thanks partially to that codependency that it was so easy for me to forget. Mm -hmm. such a young age. Um, and now I had to learn to draw boundaries later in life, but that's probably what facilitated that ease of forgiveness. And so I was, because I was sensitive, I didn't really go talk to people. I felt kind of like the, the quiet kid in the corner in school, although I was kind of a class clown. And I did that so that people would come up and talk to me and I could, you know, kind of facilitate that communication um, instead of me going up and talking to them. And it's the same reason I started playing um, guitar, too, because I saw that if you were in a band, people would come up and talk to you. And I wouldn't have to overcome that fear or that insecurity of talking to people. Um, and it worked really well. And it was a great plan. Um, Is that a common thing with musicians? I wouldn't doubt it. I don't know, but uh, I wouldn't <laughs> doubt it. And my mom, she was very creative, um, whether it's painting or decoupage, pottery. She, could, she had a really nice voice. Um, she was really creative. And, uh, and then the um, Dan Melman uh, numerical system, uh, she's a three, and that's a sensitivity expression. And she knows how to express herself, for better or worse. So to not very too much from your question. That's how I ended up, ended up becoming a musician. And it was so much fun. I had a natural knack for harmony because my mom would always be playing music around the house, whether it's Ray Charles or Jethro Tull or Christmas carols, you name it, you know, Andy Williams, you name it. So I was just raised in that environment of music. And that was my alarm clock when I was, you know, going to school. I would wake up to her putting on makeup and listening to some sort of music. And um, just, we end up being good at whatever environment we grow up in, for better or for worse. And that's probably what facilitated that. And then once I started really having fun with it and they exploring um, 
the drugs, the type of music that it was really drawn toward. This is the more psychedelic stuff, you know, Pink Floyd and uh, stuff like that. And then later on, stuff like Depeche Mode and, and stuff that was like not the high, highest or brightest vibration, so to speak, but at least it was real. And and that's that's what I was drawn to, stuff that was genuine and real. It, it may have been dark, may have been a little bit ugly, but at least it was legitimate and real. What does that mean for you, that it was real? The music was real. It was, it was written from a place that I understood. Maybe I wasn't completely healed, you know, through all that, from all that trauma as a kid. And good, truth be told, I'm probably still working through that. But I related very much to that kind of darker music and the chance of freedom through substance abuse. I, I got pretty deep into it. Um, I had been living so much for the weekend when I was a kid because I was with my mom and stepped out on the weekdays. I had lived for spending time with my father on the weekends. So I was living for the weekend, you know, when I was a kid. Um, and that transferred very nicely into uh, my teen years and adult years. So how old were you when you first started playing music? I picked up a guitar first time at, I think, 13 or 14. And then the passion grew or the drive grew because of the attention. And so then when did you start playing like in a band professionally? Uh, I played in some bands, I mean, at 16 and 17. But I, that's when I really got heavier into the drugs. And I was too busy doing drugs to go play jobs, to play, go play gigs. So, but I had a friend when I was 24, a friend that I had known, he was a keyboard player. And I was about four years into my addiction. And he had been in a band traveling out through the Midwest. And they were going to put together a new band. and they. He called me and he said, would you like to come audition for this band? And I said, heck yeah, because I knew I needed to get out of Kansas City or I was going to kill myself or end up in jail. Okay. And so I said yes, and I passed the audition. And so I got out of town. And I kind of thank him every day. Um, you know, thanks for that soul contract, I think, that we had together um, that pulled me away from that mess that I was in. Let me ask you a couple questions around that. Um, so how did you first get introduced to drugs? Well, probably through the music. Okay. You know, we used to drink beer. We had to go over the Kansas state line to get the, the Kansas oh. beer, which was not as strong as Missouri. So, you know, it's a high school kids just out drinking beer. Okay. And then that led to smoking some pot. And that led to some some uh, some mescaline and some mushrooms and some LSD, which I do not regret doing, the hallucinogenics. That opened up a whole memory for me. It's like, now I can say it's what helped me to remember our true nature without this veil of forgetting that's between us. Mm -hmm. It takes those blinders off, and uh, I, I don't regret doing those at all. It removes the ego so much, right? Um, I haven't had that experience, but um, ayahuasca journey, it's plant medicine. Um, so getting back to the music journey, uh, which is intriguing to me, I remember when my sister introduced me to, I have a older, five years older than me, introduced me to Jackson Brown when I was very young. And I remember her saying distinctly, I like his stuff when he's suffering, when his music is so much better when he's suffering. And so I, when you were describing the darkness or the dark music or the real music, I think maybe that's what you were tapping into is, is the music that is really just expressing the trauma or the suffering really comes out raw. Right. And now it's correct. I mean, I was a happy kid. And then I learned to be even happier because of the trauma that we go through. You know, people put on a, a happy face and we, we, we coping mechanisms. Um, but as far as the music, I related more to that, the stuff which was authentically um, a little bit painful. And none of my parents 
wanted me to be a musician. And when I told them I was interested, they know oh, you're not doing that. And as I like, you tell a young teenager, you're not going to do that. Well, that's what I'm going to do now. You just force me to do it. Um, so, but to your question about why I liked that, the, the darker side, yeah. And that just related to it. You know, it just spoke to me like other people go through this stuff too. It's not just me. Yeah. And then you took the gig and you got on the road. And then was this a period of time where you were like, okay, I'm going to leave all that behind. I'm going to leave the drugs behind. I'm going to leave the darkness behind. Or how did that, how did that transition? Uh, I wasn't thinking that much ahead. I was still 24 and uh, very much a drug addict. Um, I just knew that I had to get out of town and that was my ticket out. Okay. I wanted to escape it. You know, I wanted to get out of it. Uh, and it, it was a good plan. It'll work. And I'm really grateful for that. And um, did I answer the question? So the, you transitioned to this band. Were you on the road or was it a, a regular gig somewhere? It was, yeah, you were on the road. it was road work. We took it out to L.A., you know, young men seeking their fortune in Los Angeles. And, uh, of course, we got chewed up out there and spit out. Um, it was a good band. It's just, we were Midwestern boys, and, well, we put it together right, and we got out there, we made mostly covers we were playing, and uh, we are playing all this really, really current stuff, and a lot of new wave stuff back then, 83, 84, and uh, we, we were kind of ahead of the curve, because we were paying so much attention to the Billboard charts, and what was coming up and what was probably going to be really popular in three months we were really good at riding that wave but we ended up being like ahead of the, the public you know as far as the bar scene you know like you could go over and see it in the the jukeboxes when we had jukeboxes back then um like all of our material was on the jukebox because it was the newest material but people were still wanting stuff to, you know to listen to that was you know two or three years older because that's what they're used to uh, listening to. And fact, how long did you make it in, in L.A.? How long were you there? Uh, only about two and a half years. Also, also considering all the road work between the L.A. gigs. Because most of it was road work. And so that takes you to what's your next chapter there? I was 27 and there was no work in Los Angeles for me. I, didn't, I simply wasn't a good enough musician. That's so long and short of it. And my dad had spent a couple of years in Vegas. He was learning to be a car dealer and stuff like that. And he was back in Kansas City at that point. But he said, well, why don't you go to Vegas and see, you know, what you can do there? And I was like, yeah, a real mus musician doesn't go to Vegas. And so I tried it, and it worked out great. And I had, as you mentioned, a 30-year career there. And uh, really successful on some really well-established uh, production shows and bands. And uh, it worked out great. Did you do any of your own music while you were there? Or mostly covers? Or were you working in, like you said, shows? Mostly shows and covers. Okay. Um, I started writing, composing stuff, 1990 or so. Started home recording. And I wasn't great at that either, but you, know, you do something often enough, you get pretty good at it. Well, nobody, nobody's good coming out the, you know, out the box, right? It takes time. So in your, in your years in Vegas, what was your spiritual journey like at that point? Well, Vegas, if you have a weakness, that town will find it. I was playing till two or three in the morning, sometimes five in the morning. So we would stay up till noon, party Vegas in the eighties, you know, and then it was person that I met her uh, at the Las Vegas film. I was in a production show, a really good show. And a gal came in and we made eye contact and she was someone that, you know, would look you right in the eye. And that always appealed to me. So we started speaking and she was with an organization called the Railings that you mentioned up front. We started talking and we met for pizza the, the night after, and it was her last night in town. She was going to Los Angeles the next day with this guy, Rael, to give a lecture. 
they had just given one in Vegas. So they were doing like a little tour and going to Los Angeles next. So I, I wanted to see her. So I went down to Los Angeles the next day and uh, listened to him speak. And I wasn't terribly impressed. I mean, a lot of what he said made sense because it was my dad who was always open-minded. He knew about and was reading books about it, about, uh, by Eric von Danik and Robert Monroe. So we, I knew about the ancient astronaut theory and all that uh, from the time I was about nine years old, thanks to my dad. Okay, what is the ancient astronaut theory? The ETs came here and either genetically created all life on Earth or came here and upgraded it and jump-started it and did some genetic manipulation okay. into that. The ancient astronauts, the TV show that's been on for 15, 20 years now. Ancient aliens. That's what it was, yeah, ancient, ancient aliens. And uh, so by the time that program came on, I was already in the railing movement for a few years and, and knew about the ET theory for 20-some years already. So I was really familiar with that. Just like you were wanting to say something. Yeah, sorry, I have so many questions. So this was the 80s or the or the, when you met this gal? That was 1992. Okay, so early 90s and this gal strikes your fancy. You follow her to L.A. and then you hear, and I want to pronounce it correctly, Rael speak. And by this point, how old was this organization? He founded it in early 74, and he said that the first contact he had was, was with an extraterrestrial in December of 1973. And so it, it, it was started in 1974, so it had been gone, going for 18 years by the time I... They met him. And what is the basis of this organization? What is their belief structure? That all life on Earth was created by a race of extraterrestrials, and that they were called Elohim in the Bible, in the first day Elohim. This and the second day, Elohim did that. And that's what this tattoo on the arm means. Elohim, okay. The Hebrew word. And that they had created all life on earth, and uh, including man in their image. Gosh, it's funny to speak about this. I haven't spoken about it in years since I left the organization 10 years ago. Well, it's very intriguing, you know, and it's all part of our journey, which is what I really want that message to get out is that. Life is to be experienced, and as you move through these experiences, you are growing, you are healing, you are expanding. And if we yeah. deny those past experiences, or if we, we yeah. try to not change in any way and not experience things, then we atrophy. We atrophy mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. So I love your authenticity. I love that you wrote this book. I want to make sure everybody sees this book. Links will be below or in the description, because I think it's really important for us to share our vulnerabilities and share these experiences that might be a little out there for people, right? And I'm intrigued by everyone's story. So I like to ask questions and dig in. And, and so I thank you for, for your authenticity to be able to share this. Right. So yeah, I mean, sometimes I mean, a big right on to what you were saying is each person's journey I mean, if we look back at it, if I look back at it now and spend 23 years in, in what I would consider a cult now, and parenthetically, one, what, what is a cult anyway? You know, just because a religion becomes big doesn't mean it's not a cult anymore, or just because an organization stays small doesn't mean that it is or isn't a cult. Um, but each person's journey it's easy to look back and say, oh, that was a mistake. And, and I think, no, it, it, it has to happen that way. That's what gets us to the next step. And I personally believe now that the, the soul is what's driving this avatar. And the soul wants to have certain experiences, and including mine was to deny there's such a thing as a soul or a higher self or whatever you want to term it. How, whatever you... And when did that change? So as you were growing up and all through your young adult life, you didn't believe that there was a soul? It did then. It just, in the railing organization, they did not believe that there is oh. a soul. The, 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 the teaching was that ETs created us scientifically and that there is no soul in the body. But the way one would access eternal life would be through 
to an advanced cloning, if you will. So it gets quite involved, but that organization taught that there is no soul. Okay, so that's the basis of their belief structure. Yeah, the, the, is the, that created, ET's created uh, us, we have no soul. Correct. That's kind of the basis. That's kind of, there's more details, and I forgot a lot of them, thank, thankfully, because I'm on a different path now. But yeah, there was, there's no soul. It, it, very materialistic, very nihilistic. That there's no, but it's just the era now. Um, very uh, hedonistic too. So, okay, so tell me about that. Well, I mean, there's lots, lots of interviews that I did that have bit me in the butt, you know, 10, 20 years later, um, because I'm not that person that I was 10 or 20 years ago or 15, 20 years ago, um, where I was espousing the philosophy that, um, yeah, live for pleasure, you know, and I still believe that, live for pleasure, but I believe there's more than just the physical pleasures now, more than ever. Um, and since I love yoga so much, and especially the mystical and the uh, esoteric teachings of it, that sure. not answering your question, I'm going somewhere else. Guide me back, sorry. That's okay. Um, that more than ever, I'm quite certain that this is just the avatar and the soul wants to experience certain things here in this incarnation or other incarnations. And that as yoga teaches, uh, this is just a shell. And when it's gone, you know, the real you continues as most religions believe. But I'm telling you, I had to go way around the long version to get back to that. So do you think that this, this cult being hedonistic, no soul. I just really spoke to your pleasure zones, right? Because you were coming off of drug addiction, which did did that go away when you entered the movement? A really good question. And I would say yes and no. And the first part of your question was, did that appeal to me because of my addictions? Yes, but not the way I think you were heading toward. Um, it did because I found something that made sense. It made sense that we were created by extraterrestrials. And I still believe they had something to do with the creation of life on Earth and humanity. I just don't think it was exactly what Rael was espousing. I did not, even in, in that organization, I ended up being like the number four, or number five person on the planet in the organization. Of how thousands, uh, tens of thousands? Tens of thousands of people. Wow. Yeah. Because I have good organizational skills. I say you're an overachiever. But I was never drawn to like the hedonistic part of it, where like they have different sexual partners or anything like that. I was never drawn to that. You know, I, I was always I'm doing good to keep up with one person. So I, that never appealed. To me. That's the and the ironic. But you didn't judge it, although it wasn't a, a personal. And I assume that there were others in the organization that that maybe didn't resonate with, but they resonated with certain aspects of it. And so they stayed in. Totally. Uh, yeah. So you became the number four person. How long did it take you to get to that level? Oh, I don't know, 15 years or something. And did you give up music completely when you went into? Not really. No, no, this it, it was a volunteer organization. Um, no one got paid. That's something I very much liked because you find out who's who in a philosophical or religious organization when money gets involved. And none of us got paid. So I, I very much liked that. And but I did music full time. And actually, that's when I really dove deeper into writing music too and uh, becoming, you know, trying to blossom more as an artist, which is also a philosophy very much promoted, you know, blossoming of the person. I mean, just go your own direction, flower and blossom as you will, which I still very much agree with. There's a lot of really good teaching in that organization. And so would you say that that was the most creative time 
that you had when you started yeah. to write music and the music that you've shared with me i did i have to say i, I did like a, a ricky deep dive i was down the rabbit hole with your music and online and i mean i really like it and um yeah. and it's very different to the genres that you shared with me and that music was that created during this time yes okay it's beautiful which i'll play some of it so this gal that kind of reeled you in was she one of the motivators of why you you got involved and why you stayed so long logical question but i i, I wasn't a, a complete fool i realized very soon that well, this might be a cult and she may be trying to, to kind of lure me in uh, so i i told her within two weeks she lived in montreal okay and I was in Vegas, and we were on the phone. I said, um, I don't mean any offense, but, you know, I have to, to have to separate you from this book that I'm reading, which is about Rael and what happened to him. Okay. And she said, no, I very much uh, agree with that. You know, we are two different things. You know, this organization and her, I, I separated those immediately because I do it might be a call. Even early on, you thought it. Yeah, and, and, and again, I don't want to... I think I didn't want to harp on that word cult, um, but I knew it was a word that most people would relate to. So I, I allowed the editor to use the word cult. You know, but I'll, I'll call the Catholic Church a cult. I'll call Buddhism a cult. I'll call any, especially minor organization, a cult. And so let's um, let's look up the meaning of cult. It comes from the Latin cultos. Okay, I won't have to look it up. Tell me. Uh, you better look it up. <laughs> Let's I see. have a whole arsenal of etymology that I've tested. So online, the Oxford Dictionary says, a relatively small group of people having beliefs or practices, especially relating to religion, that are regarded by others as strange or sinister or as imposing excessive control over members. Bingo. That, that sounds like... Um... The classical definition, being in it for 20, almost 30 years, and being out of it for 10 years. I agree with some of that definition, and I don't agree with some of it. Um, but that definition, like a lot of definitions, uh, is written by the winners of the war, um, society in general, and who want to put things on their fringe that seem to, like, ah, I don't want to think about it, so it's on the fringe. And I'm way down that rabbit hole uh, these days, especially the past seven years. So that could be a whole. Well, and words are tricky, right? They they program. So the words that we speak are very important and very powerful, and we're creating with our words. And when you are not mm -hmm. mindful of the words that you speak, then you are often creating things that you do not desire. I get what you're saying as far as the word and why why it's not resonating with you in some aspects. Um, just like the, the words or the phrase conspiracy theory, right? Or theorist, so many that was created just for the very reason, like maybe the word cult, to be off-putting, to be demeaning. People not to say. And what it really means is just, it's truth seekers. And I've been a truth seeker my entire life. I mean, it's like my mantra. I guess you could label me that. Um, but anyway, getting back to the Raelians. So are they still... No, okay, there was a documentary done about the organization fairly recently. It's heard about that. And there's, a, there's an image of me in there. Oh, there is? One of our mutual friends of a mutual friend mm -hmm. reached out and texted me and said, I thought you left that organization. I said, I did. He said, well, you have that image of you in here. And he told me where it is. And uh, and I kind of hit the ceiling because uh, I didn't want to be associated with that sure. anymore. But it turns out that they did. you did... watch it? No, no. I don't want to attach my energy. Gotcha. Any of that. I'll say this because I was head of legal affairs for that organization too. And every documentary that was made about us was a lie. They go to the sensational route. Oh, they believe in free sex. They believe in UFOs and little green men. Tee hee hee hee. Uh, in order to, to get viewers. And to, that's what they do on social media, right? 
Yeah, and in, in order to make it juicy, and, and you know, and dozens and dozens and dozens of times, um, they betrayed trust in an interview and made you say something that you didn't say. That's that's what the media does. We won't be doing that here. <laughs> um, so, what would you say were the top three highlights of your time in the Raelian movement? Like, Time-wise or just event-wise? Just event-wise. What were the top three takeaways for you that were positive? I, um, immediately, I became sober. I stopped smoking, <laughs> drinking, drugs overnight, literally, because I wanted to have all my faculties free so that I could study and figure out what was going on with this teaching because it made sense and that I had to have a clear head in order to study it. So that was the first thing that happened. And then I became more and more healthy because I wasn't encumbered and held down by the, the addictions. So I became, you know, physically more active and just clearer, you know, duh. And, um, and then I just became more outgoing. I, I wasn't an introvert anymore. I was still sensitive and I developed my artistic side but I wasn't a shut in anymore. So it kind of got me out of my shell a little bit. That's pretty big takeaways. Yeah. And what would you say were the three less than optimal takeaways? It was hard to see until after the fact that it was limiting. It was limiting because you're still, any belief system, if you're not able to question it, question it, question it, and go way outside it, to try to find some clarity or something to uh, debunk it, um, then it's holding you back. And there were some some things holding me back. And truth be told, I probably could have left the, the organization eight years sooner than I did um, and wouldn't have missed a beat, but I'm a really loyal person. And I was really grateful for that teaching. I just didn't realize that it had nothing more to teach me until about eight or 10 years um, after that fact. Did that make sense? Sure, absolutely. What was the teaching? You invested 23 years. It's a big investment. That chapter, your takeaway, getting sober, amazing. But what, what was the spiritual takeaway? It's, it's the philosophy very similar to Buddhism. Very, very similar to Buddhism. And that their Buddhism doesn't really attach a lot of import to a god. Um, More of a philosophy of living. Exactly. Okay, brilliant. Leaving the movement, did you feel any angst or shame or guilt or any emotion that like I made a mistake. Do you mean feel any angst or guilt, etc., by being in it? No, by leaving. Oh, great. I thought I would, but because I said I'm a, a really loyal person and, and, and I am devoted, you know, to my friends or uh, the few relationships that I've had, I am devoted. And um, that was no exception. And I thought I was going to feel that like guilt. And, and as soon as I pushed send on my keyboard, I felt this huge release. And I didn't even believe in a soul at the time, but I just felt an energetic release. It's like, I feel 15 pounds lighter just sitting here. And I couldn't explain it, but I felt freedom. And I understand much more what it is now because of Akashic Records readings and, and stuff like this and soul contracts. And that's exactly what it was. It was a graduation for me. That's brilliant. And that's exactly what the Akashic Records said too. It was, it was your graduation. Well, hold that because we're going to pick that up where we're going to do a little more deeper dive into your spirituality now, yoga, and talk about overcoming obstacles and some more fun stuff. Hope you enjoyed part one with Ricky Rohr, and thank you for hanging out with us. 
We can't do this without you, so please subscribe and click that notification button to be reminded when we drop the new episodes. In part two, that will drop Tuesday, you will learn more about the wisdom Ricky has gleaned from his extraordinary experiences in the Raelian movement and awakening to deeper spiritual truths through yoga. Stay with us and enjoy an excerpt of Ricky's beautiful music. Say